Oh, the four and five year old. What a bridge gap year that is. At four, we have our executive pathway available to us. We have regulation, self-regulation available to us. Don't hear me say it's firm, okay? It's available. We have inhibition of a of our sympathetic arousal available to us. And now everybody is talking to me a bit about becoming a big girl and a big boy and going to big school, right? And I'm like, well, can I do this? Uh, what what if what if I can't what what if I cannot separate from my parent what can what if I can't do it without anybody right there's a little fear in there and oftentimes in that phase nightmare starts to come up again in very typical development because they take their fears and worries to bed with them okay so it's a very much a growing period of social emotional independence and you will see in their play they often will do like big power play and then suddenly they will do play of somebody needing a hug and, and needing a pacifier and playing, crying like a baby, right? It's all okay. It's all part of the job. It's all part of the job of growing up. It's it's that need for, can I be nurtured and, aware, and can I be where my mommy can take care of me or can I go out there and actually take care of myself in that big classroom? So it's very common, too, that when they are still in preschool at this stage, that they have much better behavior in preschool than at home, okay? At home, that's their safe space. They can practice anything on you. They know you're going to love them again tomorrow, okay? But in preschool, I'm starting to see that if I'm a kid with all kinds of um tantrums and things like that, I'm beginning to see that others are looking at me and that there is a perspective there that they're taking on me. And so there's a willingness in me to want to try the best I can just to stay okay so that I can be accepted, loved, and not rejected. Lots and lots of sibling rivalry still at this age, for sure. In the imaginative play, they start to move away from um, that whole thing about the parents, the parents, the parents, and they become a little bit more They've already started that in the previous year, but more now the social peer play um, and being with peers and playing dress up with the peers and, and creating games together and creating themes together and going on discoveries and, um, and, and having um, their own stories that they're making up. And you be this guy this now today and tomorrow I'll be this person. Um, and they act out really a lot of their personal stuff in their play themes, the things that they are thinking about, the things that they're worried about. You'll often also see, even at the previous phase in three, but also in four and five in this stage, you'll see that they they usually gravitate towards some of the movies they're watching. Like let's say you're allowing them to watch Disney. They may resonate with a certain story and they may want to play out that story a lot. And you're like, what's it about that story? It's good to be curious about it, but don't ask about it. Because it's their process and they need to go through it and they need to figure out what's it in this in the story that they like. I remember working with a little girl where um who was a sibling to an autistic elder sister. And the, the movie Frozen, where Anna is sitting in front of the door, needing for um um for Elsa to come out and play. But Elsa can't come out and play because she's hiding her powers behind the door. She has an individual difference. And, and that difference is just something that's making her afraid. And Anna, the sibling, can't understand it. So she sits at that door, dejected, and says, Do you want to build a snowman? Right? And she sings that lovely song because, can you just come out and play? I just want to play with you, right? And so sometimes they play out these scenes over and over and over. Right. Um, because they have this need in themselves that it resonates with them. Disney is very smart in what they do and who's the hero and who's the heroine and and how this all pans out and what problem is to be solved. Those things resonate at a very deep place within. And it doesn't have to be Disney. It could be any story and the stories that they ask over and over again. It's OK to wonder about that. Don't wonder too deeply because it is their process. Allow them that. 
Oh, honey, really that book again? No, just do that book again. Okay. Um, maybe sometimes you can also help them to build out of the story if you want, that if you're reading the same story again, you can say to her at the end of the book, before you get to the real ending, you say, what about we create our own ending to this story, right? Or what would happen if the heroine did this instead of that, right? And you can flex their thinking that way by helping them to visualize something different, but don't tell them, oh, not that book again. Can I just read this one, right? Don't go there. Because oftentimes those books and those stories have got a different value than what we would attribute to it as simply another story. Um, there's definitely fears that they're going to be losing the anchor in their parent when they are going to big boy and big girl school. And it's the, it's a definite phase of, I am different and I am a me. I'm different from my parent, different from my father, my mother, whoever is my caregivers. I am me, right? This is also the stage where gender differences come about in a very typical way where the child lets go of mother but then starts to cling on father or vice versa depending on your constellation and, and is, is working out what is what is the different gender pieces within myself, right? Um, and this is all typical. You know, girly girls start playing with cars and and boys start playing with, girl, with, with girly toys, right? And I'm saying this not to be derogative in my terminology. I'm saying this as a, as an, as a typical bid for exploration. And that exploration must be free. It must be free to do whatever they need to do in that exploration. And not to make too much sense of it, because all of it is still for them to make sense of. We just stand by and anchor them and support them to get through it. The social development here is also a little bit in a different level. They now really can understand and ask. Well, they can ask why questions at the age of three already, but they can't always answer it. But at this stage, they can answer it too. So why questions comes out a lot also, and you can expect them to answer why and causal question. Um, but this is also the stage, unfortunately, where you can start to see bullying amongst peers. Um, very, very sad situation. Um, but bullying can occur already at very, very young and tender ages. And again, you want to look at that whole thing about loneliness versus being alone, being okay to be alone now right? It doesn't make you lonely, which was different when they were in age three, that that steered them in a direction of when I'm alone, I'm going to automatically feel lonely. So there is definite worries and anxieties at this stage that's quite typical for this age. The whole thing about when they have to work through the concept of death and dying. So many stories that we see on TV or, or in kids' books, you know, this one died this father, this king died, and this grandmother died, and this one's a stepmother, and the, you know the, all of these these themes that comes out in very early and young stories. So, how do they understand death and dying? How do they understand what does it mean to be forever? I'm never ever going to see my grandpa again. He was here last weekend, and now he's gone. How do I how do I get that? How do I understand what that means? We need to play it out. And the worry that if somebody dies, even though they may not have been as close, but they can see the, the anguish on the parents' faces because it may have been close to them, then the worry comes, what happens if my mom dies? What happens if my dad dies? That's, that's a tough one. Tough one for them to overcome. At this stage, if the parents are going through some difficulty and there may be talk of divorce or there is real divorce oftentimes at this stage the kid will take the blame on them oh it's because I kicked the ball through the window that's why my daddy's not coming home tonight right not at all the reality of the story but it can become their reality so the answer is not to hide things from them to be always authentic because they can know when we are patronizing them and that makes them feel even more insecure. 
So tell them the truth of the story, but don't share all the detail of the toughness of the situation and the toughness of your own emotion and give them too many, too much to handle, right? They need the clear boundary that this worry is mommy's worry. This worry is your worry. They need a clear boundary. It's okay to worry because we are going to worry, but there's a difference in who carries what worry at what given moment in time. It's such beautiful phases of development, right? It's so cool to see this little persona develop round through these ages and stages and becoming who they need to be in the fullest sense of being, right? I'm going to see you again.